Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the second part of Chapter 6. Uh, and if the last few slides of the previous lecture video were kind of confusing, don't don't worry, that's okay. And In fact, I'd probably almost say that's fairly normal just given the concepts, kind of as far as where I kind of broke things off. Uh, but we were kind of already at like an hour time. I didn't want to, want to go too much further than that. Uh, but I think hopefully today we'll bring a lot of the kind of those last few slides of the previous video into light in terms of like what's important out of those things that we were talking about and kind of what are some of the the kind of physical things that we can see or talk about <clears throat> that are going to come from all of that. Um, because we're realistically in, in general chemistry, we're not really going to do anything with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, we're not even really going to, I mean, you've heard the term now wave function, but realistically, again, how crucial is the idea of wave functions to like your, you know, the rest of general chemistry? Not very important if we kind of understand the things we talk about today. Uh, if you go on to take more chemistry or more physics, you will see that term pop up again and you'll probably go into uh, a lot more detail on the Schrodinger equation and wave functions and some of the properties of the wave functions in the math. Uh, but like I said, those are things that aren't going to be super important to this class. Um, the biggest things that we're going to be focusing on kind of talking about then today uh, are really the quantum numbers. right? And this is where we kind of left off last time. So we left off really saying that for these wave functions, like these what are really... The, the best way to think of these wave functions is we often refer to them as atomic orbitals, which we'll talk a good bit about today in terms of kind of different types of orbitals and shapes and things like that. <clears throat> but also just the fact that these wave functions, they're really just a mathematical function that's a solution to that Schrodinger equation. And we can simplify all of the math involved in that process, at least for the hydrogen atom in particular, simplify it down significantly. Um, and talk about things from a perspective of just quantum numbers instead of having to look at the mathematical equations or functions themselves. Uh, and so the way we break this down, we use what we call these quantum numbers, and there's four of them in total. And like we were saying at the very end last time, uh, the first set of three quantum numbers is always going to be basically a description of something called an atomic orbital in an atom. And then if we actually have a fourth quantum number, that we're going to add to talk about a particular system or a wave function. Now we're actually talking about really like the electron specifically, like a single electron. Um, but for us, most of the time, more often than not, we're usually talking about quantum numbers as sets of three. It's going to be probably the more usual uh, thing that we're looking at, uh, which means we're really looking at our mathematical wave functions as like atomic orbitals. Um, they're like three-dimensional shapes that the mathematical functions give us. Um, and that's what we're going to be kind of talking a little bit about here as we go forward. Now. The individual quantum numbers themselves, I mentioned there's four of them in total, right? So here's the main four. We have what's called the principal quantum number, and the QN for all of them just is abbreviated for quantum number. Uh, we have the principal quantum number. It's represented by a lowercase n. We have something called an angular momentum quantum number, represented by a lowercase l. And you'll sometimes hear this angular momentum quantum number also uh, referred to as the azimuthal quantum number, although I think that's a bit of an older term that's kind of been phased out probably going to hear it called the angular momentum quantum number if you hear people talk about its name. Or realistically, you'll probably just be talking about L, which is its symbol. Um, we have what we call the magnetic quantum number, which is going to be M with an L subscript, because then there's also the fourth quantum number is what we call magnetic spin quantum number, which is going to be M sub S. Now, what we care about for each of these different quantum numbers is going to be kind of like what piece of information does each of them give us? And what are the actual, we call allowed values, like numerical values, that these numbers can have? Because basically, the, the way these quantum numbers work is that these quantum numbers, they're all going to be whole numbers of some kind, but they could, in some cases, like for uh, L, and, I'm sorry, for M sub L in particular, they can be like even negative uh, whole numbers or negative integers. <clears throat> and we just want to know how do these numbers kind of relate to one another, and then what do those numbers specifically tell us? about that particular orbital or electron that we're looking at. So to kind of break down the, the things that each of these quantum numbers are going to tell us. For our principal quantum number n, n is going to give us the orbital size or energy for the orbital that we're looking at, or the basically the approximate size of the orbital and energy of the orbital that the electron we're looking at is in. <clears throat> and for numerical values, n is going to be basically our whole number starting at 1. So it starts at 1, 2, 3, et cetera, goes up. Uh, and if we want, we can actually even relate the n quantum number in particular to the periodic table to a, a rough extent. Um, and so if I actually, I'm going to zoom out because I have a periodic table up here kind of ready to go. 
Um, if we're looking at the periodic table, the rows on the periodic table, so like with hydrogen, helium is the first row, like lithium, beryllium in the second row, and, and so on going down, the in value is really the row on the periodic table is one of the other ways to think about that. Um, as we get a little bit further in electron configurations, we'll see that like the D block and the F block of the periodic table are a little bit strange in terms of how, how they really uh, look at the in value. Uh, but in general, for like your S block over here and your P block over here, your in value is just the row in the periodic table that you're in. That's another way to think about like what is it really telling you. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> and so if we look then at our, our next quantum number, the angular momentum quantum number, this is where we're going to start to get a little bit more specific on things. <clears throat> and so what the angular momentum quantum number is going to tell us is it's going to tell us the orbital shape or the orbital type that we're actually looking at. And it has a couple of allowed values. Um, its possible values are zero, uh, starts at zero, and can go basically all the way up to n minus one. I have one included here in this list, but if n, our principal quantum number, is just one, the only value L can have is actually just zero, because in, if we take n minus one, one minus one is zero, so we can't get bigger than zero. So start at zero, and L just goes up. It can be a maximum size of whatever n is minus one. That's the biggest it can get. <clears throat> now, in terms of what are our different orbital types and shapes, so I'm going to break off a little bit and kind of just show some of this. I think it's better to kind of write out for, for some of this to see. And so if we're looking at our different L values, we said L can start at 0, and really it can go up to, for what we'll see on our current periodic table, we really only see L go up to about 3. We don't see it really get much bigger than that. Um, same thing, like when we talk about the n value relating to the periodic table, like we don't really see an n on our current periodic table past 7, although if we discover any new elements, we actually will go past that at this point in time, um, but that is currently where things are. Like n is not bigger than 7 on our current periodic table. <clears throat> now, for each of these L values, each of these L values corresponds to a particular orbital type or shape, and so we will be taking a look at kind of visually what some of those look like in a moment. Um, but to just label each of these, if L is zero, that means we're talking specifically about what we call an S orbital. Right? If L is one, we call this a P orbital. <clears throat> if L is two, we call it a D orbital. And if L is three, then it's going to be an F orbital. And like I said, we don't see anything on the periodic table currently past this. Um, theoretically, it can get bigger. Like if L were to go to four or beyond, it actually just becomes alphabetical. So like after G, it would get, or I'm sorry, after F, it would go to like G, H, and so on. Um, the start of this, actually, these all stand for kind of like specific terms, like S is sharp, like D is diffuse, F is fine, things like that. Um, that are were terms that were used to try and describe different features of those orbital types uh, when scientists were first describing them or kind of first discovering them. Uh, but those are really, we just kind of abbreviate now, we just have like S, P, D, and F orbitals that we usually talk about. And these things do all have different shapes, right? And so the, the basic shape of an S orbital, and we'll see a few uh, images that will be able to draw this much better than what my artistic skills are going to be able to. I'm just going to simply draw kind of a circle here, but in three dimensions, a circle is really a sphere. So S orbitals are spherical in their general shape. Uh, P orbitals, typically going to see these take on kind of almost like a a peanut or a dumbbell type shape where there's kind of two lobes and I'm going to shade one half of this just because that's typically how you often see them drawn is with two different colors to them uh, and the colors simply just mean that that remember these these shapes these are basically what if we take the wave function those mathematical functions that we talked about before that really are being described by all these quantum numbers if we plot these in a three-dimensional plot these are the shapes that those things are going to give us and any shading that we see in these orbitals, all that's meant to do is basically tell us whether like a particular side is positive or negative. So it really just tells us a sign change in the wave function itself. So uh, there's not necessarily a general convention, like, uh, convention, excuse me, where like shaded is always positive or negative. Like it doesn't really matter. Um, basically, this side is the opposite sign mathematically is whatever this side is. That's all that really means. Um, we'll see some things a little bit later on this semester if we do a little. Once we talk a little bit more in depth about bonding. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how the shading can actually be important uh, to these orbitals in terms of looking at interactions uh, between orbitals. All right, 
For our L equals 2 value for our d orbital, our general shape for these is going to look the majority of them anyway. Oh man, that was really bad. Let me try that one more time. The majority of them are going to look kind of like a four leaf clover. So again, kind of bear with my limited artistic skills. We'll see the actual images here in the slides in a minute, which are going to be much clearer than, than what I'm kind of drawing in here. Uh, and then we have our F orbitals, which shape-wise for the F orbitals, we're not really even going to worry about them for general chemistry. Um, I think I have a brief image of one that we'll show uh, a little bit later. But F orbitals are actually kind of more complicated. They're, there's not actually kind of an easy set shape to them. There's kind of multiple different shapes. Um, and in fact, depending on how you do your math and what kind of coordinate system you like, uh, there's actually a couple different sets of ways you can draw the f orbitals, which is, like I said, more beyond the scope of what we'll need for anything in Gen Chem. For us, we pretty much only ever talk about sp and d orbitals anyway. And even from a practical sense, like f orbitals don't really do much in the way of actual chemistry. They're, they're just not really involved in a lot of bonding. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit at, so at the end of today, something we'll call like core electrons versus valence electrons. F electrons pretty much always just end up core electrons on everything, and so they, they don't really matter to the behavior uh, of those electrons, like, like in terms of the atom. Like they don't really influence the chemistry. So F orbital shapes, not really that important to us most of the time. All right. Now, going back to our, our quantum numbers, and I'll kind of bounce back and forth here a little bit with the whiteboard and kind of the slides, kind of trying to show some of these things. <clears throat> If we go to our next quantum number, that magnetic quantum number, m sub l, the information this is going to tell us is something called the orbital orientation. And one of the other things I like to kind of point out is that it also tells us the number of each orbital type per energy level. And where that information comes from is the fact that the possible values of this magnetic quantum number, the m sub l, range from, this is, I know it looks like a little bit like a 1, but up here's what the 1 looks like in this font. This is actually an l. It ranges from negative L to positive L. So if that's our range, I'm going to go back to my, my whiteboard again here too. If we think about our possible M sub L values, if L, let's say if L is 1, that means M sub L can be negative 1, 0, or 1. If L is 3, though, M sub L could be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, or three. <clears throat> so what this all means, these numbers correspond to some different way that an orbital of that type can configure itself kind of in three-dimensional space. And if there's three possible m sub l values, and remember for l equals one, we set up above l is one for a p orbital. That means if there's three m sub l values, that there's three p orbitals in every single energy level. And that part of information is going to be important. And as we talk here just a little bit more about our last quantum number, you'll actually see that you can then relate this kind of information from the quantum number actually back to the periodic table. And we can see how these things kind of tie together. Um, and so that is one of the nice things here. Like these quantum numbers, they, they seem a little strange in some of the things I'm talking about right now. But as we do more examples and kind of see more applications of them, like they're actually very useful and they give us a lot of information about why there are certain numbers of atomic orbitals per energy level, you know, like why we can have so many electrons in a particular orbital type, uh, and a lot of information of that sort. Uh, and so we saw L equals one, three values there for M sub L. If L is three, there's actually seven. So in a few moments when we're talking about like our different orbital types, this is why there's seven F orbitals in a given energy level. It's because there's seven possible M sub L values. <clears throat> All right. Our last quantum number then, our magnetic spin quantum number. <clears throat> this one tells us about the spin of an electron, which I'm not going to really go into too much detail talking about like uh, the idea of electrons having what's called the spin. Uh, it suffice to say it's uh, probably well beyond the scope of, of this class, unfortunately. Uh, but the biggest thing is we just kind of uh, assign all of our electrons as having either like, really we often talk about it as being like spin up or spin down. Um, is one of the ways we'll notate it. But we can think of this from a quantum perspective. We'll often assign like an actual mathematical value above either plus one half or minus one half. And you can think of that really as being like spin up and spin down respectively uh, in terms of how we often talk about or show like electrons uh, when we start talking about something called orbital filling diagrams uh, a little bit later here. All right. Now, to summarize a lot of this information and also introduce one other new thing called orbital notation, what we see here, this is just kind of a, a chart that shows how our quantum numbers can kind of be related to one another. 
right? And so for our different in values, we can see what our possible L values can be. And then based on the L values, we can see what our possible M sub L values are. And then we also have then what we call this orbital notation. Because when we talk about atomic orbitals, this is kind of what we refer to. Like we'll often talk about like a 3P orbital or a 2S orbital or some maybe a 4D orbital. Um, and so this is a very common notation. So we do want to understand kind of where this comes from um, because it's not just random. It is actually very systematic. And so if we look at this, we see over here for all of these, whatever our in value is, that's the number at the start of your orbital notation. Right? So if you think about periodic table, it's kind of correlated to the row for at least S and P orbitals. Again, D and F will be a little bit weirder. We'll talk about those kind of a little bit later. <clears throat> and then the letter that comes after it, notice th those are all our orbital types that we just talked about. Right? So if we have a set of quantum numbers, basically we have one of those mathematical wave functions, and that wave function in particular can be described by this what we call set of quantum numbers where N is 1, L is 0, and M sub L is 0 that particular orbital that that wave function is describing is what we call a 1s orbital. And so really what we want to be able to do, like as far as kind of like questions that can come up and things like that, like we should be able to write like what would be some potential, like a set of quantum numbers for a 1s orbital. Well, if it's a 1s orbital, n has to be 1. And if it's an s orbital, l has to be 0. Notice every time l is 0, it's an s orbital that we're talking about. Right? Likewise, every time L was, is 1, so it's going to be the P orbitals that we saw before, 2 is the D, and 3 is the F. <clears throat> All right, so this table, it's kind of a, a nice summary of that. One other uh, just kind of term piece I'll point out here, this idea of something called a subshell. So subshells, what these are, like if it talks about like, the number of these, this orbital in a subshell, a subshell is basically that like energy level or that particular n value. Because notice, we have s orbitals at every single n value. We have p orbitals at every n value starting at 2 and bigger. Uh, and so we, we always want to kind of be aware of, well, how many orbitals of each type are there in each energy level? And this is where, like I said, the number of m sub l values helps us, right? So when l is 1, we have 3 m sub l values. So there's 3 of that particular orbital in that what we call a subshell. Um, and so that, that's like subshell basically just means that particular n value, like all of the orbitals in that n value um, when you see that term. Okay, now, visually, I'm gonna show these kind of orbital shapes a little bit more, like I mentioned before, uh, so that you can see them a little bit clearer than just kind of my little 2D drawings on an iPad. <clears throat> and the other thing I wanna point out here is something called nodes. Um, and so nodes, they're basically gonna be kind of like empty space that can potentially exist in orbitals. And there's a couple different types, and we'll talk about both of them here as we look at our different orbital shapes. but our first orbital shape, just in general, we're taking to take a look here at s orbitals. So s orbitals, we said before, they basically just look like a sphere. So it's kind of a, a general shape of a sphere. Here we get kind of like a cross section where we've kind of cut, sliced our, our sphere down so we can see kind of a quarter of it uh, from a couple different angles to get some perspective. As we go up in energy levels, you can basically, and this isn't 100% the most accurate way that this really happens, but it's a, I think if you're just trying to visualize this for the first time, I think this is maybe one of the easier ways to almost think about it, is that if you have a 1s orbital here that's a sphere, your 2s orbital looks like a bigger sphere all surrounding that smaller sphere that you originally started with. Uh, and there's this white space that we see here kind of in between, like the little sphere that would have been on the inside and then the bigger sphere kind of around it. That white space is what we refer to as a node. And every time you go up an energy level, you're almost kind of like, a, when we talk about like electron shells or kind of like layers of electrons almost as a way to think about it, um, these nodes are basically always going to exist kind of between the layers of electrons that you're adding. <clears throat> and so if we go up to, this is a picture of a 3s orbital, right? We basically have a little sphere inside of a bigger sphere inside of a bigger sphere yet uh, for kind of our, our general shapes of things. And, and again, we have nodes kind of in between in terms of what, what this all looks like. Um, this would be kind of like a top-down view. Uh, it does look a little bit different, for instance, if you're looking at it, right? Because it's not just simply spheres anymore. Like this is actually what you'd see like if you're looking like from above. They're not actually all enclosed spheres on the outsides. They're almost kind of like rings to an extent. 
Uh, these nodes that we see are actually this isn't, excuse me, this isn't really a top-down view. Um, this is almost like I'm like a, imagine like slicing it in half, looking through the, the top side of it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of kind of like the, the rings basically that kind of separate between our, our individual kind of layers. Uh, and again, the white space, that's just our nodes. If we're trying to count how many nodes that you actually have, um, there are some ways of doing that. <clears throat> and specifically, like the reason we care about these, this term that I keep referring to as a node, uh, these nodes are places where you actually won't find your electrons. So there's zero chance of finding an electron in kind of the white space in this 3s orbital that's drawn here. Um, our electrons are always going to be in one of these red or blue colored spaces. Um, and that really, again, it just comes from the math. If you think about like a sine wave, right, a sine wave kind of oscillates up and down, but as it does that, it crosses through zero. And so if we think about that, like where that sine wave kind of crosses through zero, that's really what these nodes are, right? And, and additionally, like the color change that you see here, this is kind of like the shading I was describing before. That's like the sine change in your wave function. And so your nodes are always between the sine changes, like the color changes that you will often see in the shadings of these things. Now, for our nodes, we have two different types. Like I said before, one is going to be what we call a radial node. And a radial node, this the easiest way to really think of radial nodes, these are the nodes that exist every time you go up that energy level and you're kind of adding that extra layer, really, of electrons. They're often spherical in shape, oops, I'm sorry, uh, which is what we pretty much see here in these images, kind of like spherical type shape for the nodes. And you can always calculate how many radial nodes any orbital has by doing n minus l minus 1 or N and L are the quantum numbers for that orbital. <clears throat> Our other type of node is actually going to be something called an angular node. Uh, and angular nodes are actually pretty easy to track, um, mainly because they're, they're going to be big nodal planes that kind of slice your orbitals into chunks. Uh, and for S orbitals, since these things are sphere, or excuse me, are spheres, there are no angular nodes for S orbitals. And in fact, we'll actually see that angular nodes are always just going to equal whatever our L value is. And again, that's that, an L right there. So there's always L angular nodes per orbital. So S orbitals, there's always zero. P orbitals will have one angular node. D orbitals always have two, and F will have three. And you can kind of see that here on the, the next slide as I show you some examples of what the P orbitals look like. So like I mentioned before, our P orbitals look kind of like a peanut or a dumbbell, and kind of its first general shape. And the, the angular node that exists in these is kind of this plane here that's kind of bisecting our orbital into two halves. And so that's what we refer to as an angular node. Angular nodes are generally going to be planes for their shape. There's a couple times where that's not the case for uh, D orbitals and F orbitals. Um, but generally these angular nodes are like just full planes, whereas our radial nodes, like I said, are kind of like the, almost like the spherical layering uh, of orbitals, like kind of almost on top of each other as you kind of add an extra energy level of electrons. <clears throat> And one thing, last thing I will point out here, kind of orbit, as we talk about our orbitals, you'll notice some notation here like PX, PY, PZ. These are commonly used to describe the names of the P orbitals, and they describe kind of how they're oriented on like an XYZ coordinate system. So it's actually pretty easy. PX just means that your lobes of your P orbital are aligned on the X axis. PY, here's your Y axis, your lobes are along the Y axis. PZ, your lobes are now along the Z axis in that coordinate system. Um, and so those are pretty common names for the P orbitals. D orbitals will also have some names that I'll show in just a second. Um, but those are going to be a little more complex. But again, I can kind of explain where those will also come from. So I'm actually just in, in the interest of trying to make this bigger for everyone to kind of see. These are these are our D orbitals for the most part. I'm actually going to just do this, though, I think, to, to help our slide view so we can see these a little bit more blown up. So these are our d orbital shapes, these first five. The very last one, like subbing, sub, or heading F down here, this actually is an F example of an F orbital. Um, but again, we're not going to worry about the F orbital shapes at all, so you can just kind of ignore it. These are the five that we are going to take a quick look at. These are what we call our d orbitals. And so these top three, you're, you're actually going to notice this one's, it's, it looks maybe a little bit strange, but just because of the angle that it's drawn at. These two kind of pink lobes right here are coming kind of like basically towards us and away from us in a way that they are stretched out just like these are. It's just kind of hard to tell because of the angle that this is drawn at. That's it. Um, really, these three d orbitals, what we call the dxy, the dyz, and the dxz, are all pretty much identical. Like They look like these four-leaf clover type shapes, and they have basically all of the lobes between any coordinate axes that are there. <clears throat> and really, that's where the names come from. Right? So dxy, all of the lobes are in the xy plane, so between the x and y axes, 
but the lobes are exactly between the axes themselves. Like they're not perfectly in line with those axes, right? D, Y, Z, we're now in the Y and Z plane with all of our lobes between the Y and the Z axis. This is the X, Z over here. Again, all the lobes are between the X and the Z axes. And then if you see squared terms show up in the name of a D orbital, that means that your lobes now are actually on those axes. So we actually have a D orbital that we call the DX squared minus Y squared, and that's where we see our lobes along the X axis. And again, for the Y squared, we see our lobes along the Y axis also. So DX squared minus Y squared, very similar to the DXY, it's just basically kind of turned, really like 45 degrees, right? It's not even a huge turn. It's just that the lobes are along the axes instead of between them. Uh, and then the last D orbital, there are because there are five of them. Remember, if we think back to our, our quantum numbers, if L is 2 for a D orbital, then M sub L could be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. There's five values. Notice there's five D orbital shapes that we're looking at here. This is the fifth one, and it is a little bit strange. It's the only one that doesn't look like kind of like a four-leaf clover shape. Instead, it looks kind of like a P orbital with a little donut around the middle, um, which we can refer to like mathematically, refer to that as a torus. Now, <clears throat> the, in terms of the name, the Z squared, again, the squared term tells you the axes your lobes are along. Well, there's only two really low, like kind of large lobes here, and they're both along the Z axis, and so that's where that name, the DZ squared name, comes from. Um, depending on who your lecture professor is, uh, they probably will want you to know the general names of the, uh, the different orbital types. Um, that is something that does show up from time to time. Uh, and as you go on to future classes, like they do get referred to there as well. Um, the P orbitals, at the very least, definitely know. If, like when you go to organic, you'll be expected to kind of know their general orientation and names. Uh, D orbitals don't come up as much in organic. But if you go beyond organic chemistry to any upper level classes, like the inorganic chemistry or things like that, uh, you will see these kind of start to show up again. Um, and so their names, uh, like I said, something probably you should know. But they really, the d orbitals, if there's no square terms, basically the two axes that are in the label, those just tell you what axes all of your lobes are between. If you see square terms in the name for the d orbital, that just means your lobes of your d orbital are along those axes. That's probably the easiest way, I think, to just uh, try and remember kind of the names of those orbitals. <clears throat> all right, now, the next piece I want to kind of move into, uh, talking about all of these orbitals, those are kind of the general atomic orbitals that we're going to be really kind of referring back to for a lot of the next kind of chapter and a half, uh, or at least the next chapter plus. And <clears throat> what the next thing we're going to be looking at is really going to deal a lot with the energy of those orbitals. Because our end goal is really all about knowing, remember we said before, like we care about all this information because we want to know where our electrons on our atoms because it's the electrons that do really all of our chemistry. So it's important for us to know then what the energies of all of these orbitals are relative to one another so that we can understand what types of orbitals our electrons are going to go into. Because remember I said before, F orbitals, those electrons pretty much always end up being, oops, apologize. Uh, those electrons always end up being kind of core electrons um, that for the most part, don't really do any chemistry. Uh, and so we want to know like what orbital type are our electrons going into because it'll influence how they interact with other things. Um, and so that's kind of the, the purpose behind why we're going to talk about these orbital energies. And when we talked about the hydrogen atom before, the only quantum number that affects the full energy of an orbital for a hydrogen atom is just the n value. That's it. Um, and this really only works because there's a single electron and really this kind of goes back to like the Rydberg equation that we talked about last time as well. Right? The Rydberg equation we said works perfectly for hydrogen, but not for anything else. Well, it works perfectly for hydrogen because every orbital that's in the same energy level for hydrogen actually has the same energy. But for everything that's not hydrogen, both your N and L, so your principal and angular momentum quantum numbers, are going to impact the energy of that particular orbital. Um, and the kind of the, the general trend we're going to see here, as we have multiple electrons and start getting electron repulsions, those repulsions can be kind of more prevalent in some orbitals than others, um, and their shapes are also going to have an effect on that, and so we'll actually see the, a slight energy difference between them. Um, and in general, kind of the, the general pattern that we'll see, like in this case, is that the bigger our n value, obviously the higher the energy, but also the bigger the L value, also the higher the energy. It's kind of the general trend of things that we will normally see. Um, and so to put that kind of into perspective and kind of draw uh, kind of some, some images here. So on the left side here, these are basically the energies of these orbitals for hydrogen. Uh, and so here's the energy of a 1s orbital. It's at the bottom. It's the lowest energy orbital on that atom. 
And then we see our 2s and our 2p orbitals on hydrogen are about the same energy. And the same thing like 3s, 3p, 3d, all the same energy. Same for all everything in the fourth energy level. But for anything that's not hydrogen, that's not the case. So this is kind of the reality for the rest of the periodic table, which is most of the time what we're really going to be working with. And so we want to understand kind of what's happening here. So we see first energy level, there's still only the s orbital. So that doesn't really change much. But for the second energy level, here are 2s, and then at slightly higher energy, we have our 2p. So like I said, L would be 0 for an s orbital, L is 1 for a p orbital. As L gets bigger, the energy of that orbital also is going to get bigger. And so the 2p orbital is higher energy than the 2s. The 3s, then the 3p is higher than the 3s. The 3d, which we now have in that third energy level, is now bigger than the 3p. Right, if we go to the fourth energy level, the 4f is higher than the 4d. So again, bigger L values, bigger energies bigger in values, bigger energies, but a couple other things to kind of, again, relate back to things we've seen before. Remember we said before with kind of that Bohr model of the atom and the Rydberg equation, as you go up in energy level, we see that our energies actually get kind of closer and closer together, the energy gaps between the energy levels. Right? Particularly for hydrogen here, like the gap between one and two, much bigger than two and three, which is bigger than three and four, and so those gaps keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? We kind of talked about that trend for the Bohr excuse me, for the Bohr model. We see the same effect for all other atoms as well, but it actually gets a little bit muddier for our other atoms because what ends up happening over here is that because our 3s, 3p, and 3d elect, uh, orbitals, excuse me, are not all the same energy, it actually ends up that our 3d orbitals can actually be a little bit higher in energy than the 4s. Um, and this is actually really important because this is going to influence how we go about adding electrons to our atoms. So once we get to a point where our atoms can have the 4s and the 3d orbitals both there, then the 4s, if it's at a lower energy, is probably going to get the electrons first, even though it's the fourth energy level versus the third energy level as far as where, where the orbitals technically are. Um, this will make a lot more sense when we see our periodic table um, and kind of relate this to the periodic table a little bit for our, what we call our electron configurations. Uh, because our periodic tables, it, it looks like it has a really weird shape, but it's actually very practical to take a lot of this information into account. And that's one of the things we'll be looking at kind of here as we go forward a little more. Now, a couple other things though before we get there. Um, and again, our, our end goal with a lot of what I'm presenting at the moment is just like with this energies, uh, like uh, orbital energy differences, and now what we call this Pauli exclusion principle. These are just to try and help us figure out where our electrons going to show up, like which orbitals are going to get electrons first. That's kind of the, the main goal of of talking about these things, like how do we fill our orbitals with electrons. And for our Pauli exclusion principle, kind of the, the, general, the general rule itself is that no two electrons in any given atom can have the exact same set of four quantum numbers. So what this means, and the fact that the fourth quantum number, that m sub s we talked about before, only has two values, one of the things that comes out of all of this is that you will only ever have two electrons in any one orbital, that's the maximum. You could have zero or one, but you can never have more than two electrons in any one orbital. Um, again, important to how we go about filling our orbitals with electrons. <clears throat> now, the other part of this, probably less relevant to what we see, although you'll see it as we draw pictures of these diagrams for putting electrons into orbitals. Uh, if there's two electrons in the same orbitals, we consider them opposite spins. And remember before, I kind of said, we'll really consider this almost like spin up and spin down. You'll see me draw like arrows up and down uh, to kind of take that into account as we look at some of these diagrams in a few minutes. <clears throat> All right, so this is kind of what we've been working our way towards the last few slides is talking about what we call electron configurations. So a couple terminology pieces first, and then we'll look at some examples, and that'll be kind of the, the, the big thing, we're kind of a uh, big ending idea we're working our way towards here today. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about electron configurations, Really what we're talking about is a general description of which orbitals have electrons in them on a given atom. Um, wh when we talk about these configurations and we're talking about like different orbitals and atoms, some of the terms you'll hear used to describe them might be that you hear things about like degenerate uh, orbitals or orbitals that have a what's called degeneracy uh, amongst them. Uh, when you hear the term degenerate in terms of orbitals, it means these orbitals have the same energy. Uh, and for any orbitals to have the same energy, that just means they have the same n and l value. But the m sub l values then will be different for them. Um, so like when we talk about like 2p orbitals, we know that for 2p there's actually three total 2p orbitals. Because if 
n is 2 and l is 1, m sub l could be negative 1, 0, or 1 from the quantum numbers we talked about before. And so as a result, that means there can be three 2p orbitals. All of them should be degenerate because the n and l value for all of them will be the same. <clears throat> right? And then our other term, this is going to be kind of the, the types of electron configurations we're usually going to be looking at. Uh, that, um, pretty much all the time for general chemistry. Um, and that's talking about what we call the ground state configuration. Um, and if you see that term, all that really means is it's the lowest energy conf uh, confirmation or configuration, which means if you just have this atom sitting there and it's, it, it's allowed to pick you know, what its most stable possible configuration is, that's the ground state configuration. It's the lowest energy one. <clears throat> and so basically we're filling all of our lowest energy orbitals uh, that we can first. It's kind of the general rule that we'll follow uh, to get those ground state configurations. Now, the last bit of this, terminology-wise, you might hear different books or different references. If you look at other examples elsewhere, talk about something called the Aufbau Principle. So what that Aufbau Principle really is, it's just kind of a, a set of descriptions or rules uh, to help you figure out how to fill your orbitals with electrons. That's it. And it kind of takes the Pauli Exclusion Principle as part of it. Um, it also has something called Hun's Rule that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and we'll look at a couple different ways also of figuring out like kind of what's the general order for filling these orbitals. Um, the, it's really based on energy that we already kind of mentioned. So why we talked about the energy differences between orbitals. We pretty much just always start at what's the lowest energy orbital possible. Put as many electrons in it as you can and go to the next lowest energy orbital possible and kind of repeat the process. Um, but there are a couple other details to that that we will have to talk about. Uh, and one of those is going to be Hun's Rule. Right, so there's Aufbau rules, which just in general, lowest energy orbitals fill first. Um, so that means like 1s will fill first, then the 2s before the 2p because it's lower in energy. Then the 2p will fill, then we'll go to the 3s and, and so on. Um, there are some anomalies here though. Um, and this actually, again, I'll show the periodic table here in a minute again, and we'll, we'll kind of reason through this some too. But we showed earlier that the 4s orbital is usually lower in energy than 3d orbitals are. Um, and so this is what the effect is, is that since the 4s orbitals are lower in energy, 4s actually will get electrons before the 3d, which is kind of out of the norm that we're seeing up here for like s and p orbitals. Um, we actually see the same thing happen between 4f and actually 6s. And again, this seems kind of strange that it does it this way, but there's kind of a, some, some silver lining here. If we use the periodic table to help us with this, it will kind of make sense to what's going on. I, I promise if we give it, give it some time and a chance to kind of be able to see those things. So we will get up to that. Um, the other part of parts of our Aufbau rules here, orbitals can only hold up to two electrons. And we already said they have, they have to have opposite spins. And the last bit, this part here, is what we call Hun's rule. Um, if we have two or more degenerate orbitals, which really it's always going to be kind of three or more. Uh, we can't really only have two for just plain atoms. Uh, so like if we have a set of p orbitals, like three p orbitals that are all degenerate, what's going to happen as we fill them, the way we fill them is we put one electron in each orbital first, and then once they're all half full, then we'll start pairing electrons. And so visually, I'll kind of show some examples of this um, here on the next slide. Uh, but we do this, and we always put the unpaired electrons in each of those orbitals as having the same spin. So we're gonna I'm going to visually show this, on, like I said, on the, on the next slide here. Um, I think it's the best way to just get to the, the image part of this. So if we're looking here, these are all examples of following Hun's rule, right? So boron, and really the way these configurations work, we're going to see this as we go as well. If we're thinking about boron, it has one electron in what we call its 2p orbitals. <coughs> Excuse me. And if it has three total 2p orbitals, putting just one electron in, well, there's only one way to really do that. But for carbon, if we have two p electrons, now we have a second electron we can add, we have a bunch of options, right? I could put that second electron in the same orbital, or I could put it in a different one, or and I could put it in a different one with a different spin. But for the ground state or the lowest energy conf, uh, configuration or confirmation, we're always going to put them in separate orbitals first, always with the same spin. And then if we go down here to say oxygen, oxygen has four total 2p electrons. So we'd have one, two, three. Now we've filled all of them half full. Now we will start to pair them. And so the fourth one comes back here and makes our first pair of electrons. Um, and so that's what Hun's rule really is in terms of how we go about uh, filling our electron configurations. <clears throat> now, again, orbital filling order. Like what orbitals are the lowest energy ones that we start with? There's a couple different ways to do this. 
I'm going to just go to the, the image side of this. One is using something called a diagonal method. I, I personally don't like this one as much, but I know a lot of people that swear by it, so I do want to kind of show it because for some people this, this may be more useful. Um, and so the way this method works is basically for each line going left to right, you're basically just writing out all the orbitals that are in that energy level. So first energy level, just 1s. Second energy level, 2s and 2p. Third will be 3s, 3p, 3d. And then 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, and so on. And if you're wondering, like, well, why does this one have 2s and 2p, and this why does this one go to d? Remember, those are your quantum numbers again. Right? The second energy level goes up to p orbitals because for our, our L values, which are those orbital types, they can only be as big as n minus 1. So if n is 2, L can only be as big as 1. If it's 0, that's s. 1 is p. That's why it stops there. Right? That's why we have to get all the way to the fourth energy level to have our f electrons, our f orbitals. Um, because at the fourth energy level, if n is 4, we can finally have L equals 3 to have f orbitals. Um, so that's why it's kind of broken up this way and why you see it that way. Um, but the way this method works is basically you draw, once you have the lines with all the electro, I'm sorry, all the orbital types uh, for those energy levels, you draw things kind of as diagonals as far as the order that things fill. So down, you're always drawing your diagonals in the downward left direction the way I have it drawn here. So down to the left goes through the 1s, then we're going to backtrack kind of up to the top. Down to the left again is going to go through the 2s, backtrack, next is 2p, then the 3s. And if we backtrack again, we're going to get to 3p, the next one is now 4s, and then we backtrack to get to actually the 3d. And we keep going through at these diagonals. And so like 3d, then 4p, then 5s, backtracking now will be 4d, 5p, 6s. And we actually do 6s, then we come back to 4f, 5d, 6p, 7s, 5f, 6d, 7p. And that's actually where our current periodic table ends for the time being. <clears throat> now... There is another way of kind of doing this. If this method doesn't make a lot of sense or you don't like the, because like some people really visually like this, um, uh, and so they, they prefer kind of looking at it this way. I personally prefer just looking at the periodic table. Right? And actually, I'm going to even go all the way out just to the, the periodic table image that I had previously. So if we're looking here at our periodic table, if we think about those orders that I was, was talking about a second ago, the very first row up here, this is my 1s. Right? There's two two elements in the first row, so there's my 1s. Then, remember, if we think about the blocks of our periodic table, the second row, this will be what we call our 2s, this is the s block. Over here we have the p block, this is our second row, so this will be the 2p. And a couple things here, if we think about our periodic table that I said that if we really pay attention to and kind of understand our quantum numbers, we can actually relate them pretty well to the periodic table. So for 2p, there's six columns in that P block, right? Just as the whole block. And so the second row also has six, all of them do. But there's six spaces across, or six columns across, because if there's three P orbitals in each energy level, and there's only two electrons per orbital, that means there's six electrons to fill those P orbitals. Well, to get six electrons, that's why there's six spots going across in that P block. Um, and we'll see that basically for all of our blocks that kind of match that. Uh, the S block is two across because there's always one S orbital that can hold two electrons. If we look at our D block here in the middle of the periodic table, it's 10 spaces across, but that's because there's five D orbitals in every energy level. And the F blocks, if we go down here, if you count this particular one, it's actually 15. That's because it's really this one can be up here. Uh, it's really only 14 spaces. Uh, it's 14 spaces across the F block because you have seven f orbitals with two electrons each. Um, and so those are kind of things on the periodic table that visually we can see that kind of we can then go back to and think about uh, and relate to our uh, quantum numbers that we've seen. Now, in terms of the orbitals, like how do we know like the order of them? I said like a second ago, like we had one s as the first row up here, then two s. If we really just follow your atomic numbers, your atomic numbers kind of tell you the order of things. There's just two things you do have to remember if you're going to do it this way, and that's that the first time you get to this D block, it starts at 3D. So this is 3D, 4D, 5D, and 6D, and the F block starts at 4. So this is 4F, and this is 5F. Um, those are the things you have to kind of remember. So like D is basically always one less than the row that you're in. F is always two less than the row that you're in. Um, and as long as you remember that, just kind of follow your quantum, I'm sorry, follow your atomic numbers on the periodic table. And so like after element two, coming to element three, after one S will be two S. Well, after we finish the two S over here, get to element number five, this is the two P, 
after the 2p ends at 10, 11 over here is in the 3s. And then after the 3s, we get to 3p over here. And then after 3p, the next atomic number is 19, but it's in the s block. And it's in the fourth row, which means this is 4s. So after 3p, we get 4s. After 4s, we go to the d block. And now this d block is going to be 3d, right? Because we said the d block is always one less than whatever the s and p ones are in that same row. So this would be 3d. Back to the p block, it's going to be the row that it's in, fourth row, so 4p. Then we have 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s over here. And now notice if you look atomic number wise, 56 is here, the 57 is down here, right? So after the 6s, that's when we're jumping down to the 4f. And so over 4f that fills, then we come back up here after the f is finished. Now we're back in our d block, and now we'll fill this, uh, the, this will be the, the 5d at that point. And then we'll have our 6p over here because again, it's the sixth row. Um, and so that's kind of how the ordering of things works. Um, and in terms of how we're going to apply all of this, we're really just going to be able to try and generate electron configurations. Um, and so that's the next thing I want to kind of try and show. And so mo most of the rest of what we look at today for examples uh, is really just going to be looking at electron configurations. So we'll start out with kind of the most basic ones, and then we'll look at some bigger ones, and we'll see what happens if we need to make ions of things. And that'll be kind of where we end today. <clears throat> so electron configurations, notation-wise, what we're basically showing, we're always going to show the orbital type, and then the number of electrons in that orbital type is going to be the superscript basically after it. So we have 1s right here, and 1 is going to be the electron configuration for hydrogen, because hydrogen has one total electron, and it's in that 1s orbital. Right? If we want to write an electron configuration for helium, helium has two electrons, they're both in that 1s orbital, and so its notation is just 1s2. If we go up to lithium, now we have multiple orbitals that will have electrons. We always start with the lowest energy one and kind of work our way up. So in this case, the lowest energy one would be 1s2, and then we go to 2s1, and where this is coming from, if I go back to the periodic table again for a second, right? we have 1s was these first two, but once that's full, now I'm into 2s, and lithium is in the first row of kind of this 2s portion of the periodic table, and so that's why it's 2s1. Beryllium would be 2s2 uh, is what it would end with instead. <clears throat> and then if we want to go to something bigger, let's take a look at something like nitrogen. So for nitrogen, again, I'm going to kind of go back actually just to the periodic table to show this thing is the best thing. Nitrogen is right here, so everything before it is full. So the 1s is full, so that's 1s2. The 2s is full, so that's 2s2. We're three spots into this 2p block, and so it'll be 2p3 is what we end with. If we go back to our slide, that's what we see, like 1s2, 2s2, 2p3 is what it ends with. Now, before we get to bigger atoms, which we will work our way to some bigger atoms, uh, the other thing that we often pair with electron configurations is something called orbital filling diagrams. Um, and so orbital filling diagrams, what these are, um, these are mainly just ways to kind of visually show an electron configuration. It's trying to show where all the electrons are actually at. So how we can go about doing that <clears throat> is that we're gonna use arrows to represent our electrons that can be drawn either up or down to kind of show the spins. Uh, and usually we'll just have like lines that those arrows are drawn on top of uh, to represent our individual orbitals. Um, the only thing to remember is I always use Hun's rule as we're filling them. Uh, in this case, the image actually uses boxes instead of just lines. A lot of times, instead of the whole box, it'll just be like the line with the electrons above them uh, for this representation of these filling diagrams. And to kind of look at this and just refresh ourselves on Hun's rule before we look at some of the orbital filling diagrams, if we wanted to know which of these would be the correct version, well, remember Hun's rule says electrons all go unpaired first, so not the first one and they always have the same spin. Uh, if we have these like sets of orbitals that are all the same energy, like we have with the 2p here, so this last one would actually be the, the correct version uh, of those uh, diagrams. All right, so visually, what would the orbital filling diagrams look like for those uh, four examples we just did configurations for? Well, for hydrogen, if we have just a 1s orbital, draw the 1s orbital, with, like I said, with the line, we'll label it underneath, and it has one electron, so it's just an arrow up. If we have helium, now we have an arrow up and an arrow down, both in the 1s orbital, because there's two electrons in that orbital. For lithium, if it's 1s2, 2s1, 
our 1s is full, and now we have a 2s that has a single electron in it, so it'll, we just kind of always default to usually drawing the arrow up first is kind of the, just the general convention for almost any resource you look at. If we go on to nitrogen, the 1s2, so the 1s is full, 2s2, so 2s is full, and then we have our 2p3, so we'd have 1s that's going to be full, 2s that's going to also be full, and then we have our 2p, which if we're looking at our electrons here, all of our p orbitals, there's three of them, right? And this is where all the quantum number stuff that we talked about before is important. Like we need to know that for p orbitals, there are three of them per energy level. And you can remember that from either, you can either just memorize that part and there's, that there's always three p orbitals or five d orbitals or seven f. Or if you know your quantum numbers really well and know like what the L values for your different orbital types are, you can always figure out, well, how many m sub L values are there? Well, when L is one, that's a p orbital. M sub L can be negative one, zero, or one. So that's why there's those three p orbitals there. <clears throat> now, for filling them, we followed Hund's rule, right? Unpaired first, all have the same spin. And we had three electrons to put in, so one, two, three. And that was it. So that would be our, our orbital filling diagram there for the nitrogen. <clears throat> all right. One last thing with configurations, then we'll take a look at doing some examples. I'll kind of do with like the, the whiteboard version things from my iPad here. So as we get to bigger atoms, specifically if we get to some of our really big atoms in the periodic table, like again, if I just kind of zoom out again for a second, if we get to something down here like gold or mercury, like it's not, well, it, it's not that it's unreasonable, it's just it takes a long time to write out like 1s2, 2s2, 2p, this would be 6 if it's full, and kind of follow that process all the way down to gold, right? That would just take a really long time to do. Um, and so a lot of the times what we will do to try and make that easier uh, is to actually use what's called shorthand configuration. Uh, for electron configurations. And so the way we kind of shortcut things a little bit is if you have an, uh, an element that's way down in the periodic table, you can actually start from the noble gas before that element. So basically go backwards to the previous noble gas, put that noble gas in square brackets. And basically what that's saying is the element we're looking at has the same configuration as this noble gas, and then we're going to label everything that comes after the noble gas part. Uh, and so that, that's kind of the, the general way that we do this. So for instance, if we were looking at calcium, argon's the previous noble gas, and I'll show this in the periodic table in just a second, and then we'd write what comes after argon to get to calcium. So to show that from the periodic table side of things, we're looking at calcium here. So back up to our previous noble gas before calcium, it was argon. So we put argon in the square brackets, and then after argon, or one, two spots in the 4S for calcium, so that's why we see our electron configuration is then argon core 4s2, and that's it. And so we'll look at a few examples here with these, uh, kind of showing the shorthand configurations. <clears throat> and so for these, you're going to see the actual normal configuration given over here, and then you'll see the actual shorthand configuration on the, on the side. So for uh, sodium, sodium has a full configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, but this first part, the first 10 electrons here, are all part of basically neon's noble gas core. And so if we looked at the periodic table for sodium, it's right after neon, so we could say neon, and then the only after neon is, this would be 3s1, was the only thing that we'd get to. So shorthand configuration then, it's gonna be neon 3s1 for sodium. If we wanted to look at some additional examples, if we take a look at phosphorus, so phosphorus, we can see the full configuration here, but I think the, honestly the easier way is just let's look at the periodic table. So here is phosphorus. If we want to give it shorthand electron configuration, the previous noble gas right here is neon. So we start the neon core again. And then after neon, we'd have, here we have both of the 3s that are full, so 3s2. And then we're three spots into the 3p. So this will be neon, 3s2, 3p3. That would be the configuration that we would see, and that's what we see here. <clears throat> take a look at uh, two more of these, I think, and then we'll we'll go into some other just kind of open examples. So <clears throat> take a look. Here we have potassium. So potassium, again, getting slightly bigger elements. Uh, but again, if we're looking at the periodic table, finding potassium, here's potassium. Previous noble gas is argon. So argon core, the only thing that's after it is just 4s1, or the first spot in the 4s. So 4s1 after that argon core. That would be our, our shorthand notation. Scandium, now we'll see something that's actually in the D block. Um, and so we'll see for our, our D block here, scandium is right here in the periodic table. 
Again, previous noble gas is again argon in this case. And then after argon we have, this is 4s2. And now this is 3d1. Right? And it is important this is the 3d that we're into at this point. Uh, and again, like, I think I said the easiest way I usually think, think of this when I'm looking at it, whatever row we're in for the S block and the P block, the row is that number. So this is like the 4P and the 4S, but the D block is always one less than the row that you're actually in, like as overall. So this is the fourth row of the periodic table, but this is the 3D. F block, when we get there, it's actually two less. So like this is the sixth row of the periodic table. That's where this first F block comes from, but it's actually 4F that we refer to that as. Okay, so scanium, argon, 4s2, 3d1 for that one. So <clears throat> what, what I want to take a look at here, if I can get the, just to cooperate with me again, there we go. Uh, there's, there are a couple exceptions to these electron configurations, kind of the normal patterns, um, but we can actually make sense of them, hopefully at least a, a little bit. Uh, and so I do want to kind of show these two. These are probably the only two elements that you'd probably really ever be expected to know are exceptions, although other elements in their columns on the periodic table also can sometimes do some similar things. Um, the two main elements that stand out, though, are going to be chromium and copper. These are what their configurations would be normally, just looking at them. So for chromium, if we look at the periodic table, chromium here, if we're looking at it, after argon, 4s2, this would be 3d4, but that's not what we actually see in reality. In reality, what we see instead is it's 4s1, 3d5. Uh, and the reason for this, and I'm actually going to use uh, some whiteboard space here since I haven't for a bit. <clears throat> so the reason for this, if we think about our d orbitals, and there are five of them all together, if we put four electrons into them, we have one electron that's, or sorry, one orbital that's just kind of different than the others, but all of these are really supposed to be the same energy. And so that's not really all that stable. And so it turns out when we have uh, the potential to move an electron from, say, if this is our 4s over here and our 3d over here, if we have the option to take one of those s electrons and move it so that our d shell is kind of evenly filled for all of the orbitals, then it will pretty much always do that. And so what instead what we end up getting here, this is why our chromium ends up 4s1 and then 3d5 is that now all of our d orbitals have a single unpaired electron, and that's actually more stable. So this over here is more stable than how this, oops, how this started. Um, and let me maybe get rid of that, right? Because if it had just the four there first, it is going to want to move the one over to get to this, because this will be the more stable configuration if all the d orbitals are filled the same way. That's really what it's trying to do. So degenerate sets of orbitals, it's so like when you have sets like 3D in particular, really, this really only happens between the S and the D. We're never going to see this happen with like the S and the P orbitals. They're not going to do that. It's just the S and the D because they end up being so close together in energy. And really, this is for chromium. So this first one, this would be back here. This was for chromium. Copper does something very similar. The only difference is instead of being 4s2, if I get all my d orbitals here, let me actually just draw one over there. So I have plenty of space here, hopefully. Sorry if my voice faded out there for a second. <clears throat> and what we're going to look at, if we put our electrons in for copper, normally it would have 9, or we'd expect it to have 9. That means all of these d orbitals would be full except for the last one. So it's going to do pretty much the same thing we saw above with chromium. It's going to move one electron over so that all the d orbitals can be filled the exact same way. And it'll actually what we call fill the full d shell. So the d shell will actually be full of electrons, and that's just more stable for the atom itself as a whole. And so the ground state, the lowest energy configuration, is actually going to be what we see, sorry about that, over here on the right. Um, so 4s1, 3d10, that's what we see for copper, uh, because that is going to give us all of our d or, uh, orbitals being filled the same way, which is just more stable. If you have to move more than one electron to do that, it usually won't do that. But if you can move just one s electron to the d and get a half full shell or a full shell, you will typically see that happen. That's kind of the reasoning behind that.
So I think we've done enough talking about kind of some things with configurations. I think the, the best thing now is probably just to look at some examples. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at doing iodine, manganese, and this is bismuth at the bottom. All right. So best thing, I think, for doing these, instead of uh, actually uh, showing this from the slides, I'm going to minimize this just kind of out of the way for now. And I'm going to look at just writing these out from the periodic table. So if I look for iodine, and I'm going to write out the full configuration first, and then we'll write the shorthand notation. Uh, and I'm just going to do shorthand for the two that come after it because I think that's realistically shorthand notation is what you're going to be asked to give the vast majority of the time. Uh, and so we'll take a look, full, full configuration here first for iodine. So starting at the very beginning here, we need to work our way all the way to iodine over here. So the way I usually do this, just kind of counting across, here's our first row. We're past the first row, so 1s is full. So I'm going to start this with 1s2. Then the 2s is full here. So that's going to be 2s2. I'm going to slide this over just a little bit so we can hopefully see. No, actually, it might be easier to do it this way. Sorry. Give me a second so I can rearrange this maybe the best way that makes visual sense for you guys. <clears throat> so I have 1s2, 2s2, after the 2s. Here we're into 2p. So it'll be 2p6 because all six of these are full. We're past it. Then we'd have 3s, which is also full, so 3s2. After that, here we get to this part. This is 3p, also full, so 3p6. After 3p is, this is 4s. It's also full, so 4s2. Next is, this is, remember, 3d now. So it would be 3d10. And then after 3d, now we have 4p, also full, all six. So 4p6. 5s, and I'm actually going to run myself out of room here, unfortunately. Bad, bad spacing on my part. Uh, 5s is the next one if we, after the krypton. 5s2. And then if we keep going, here is 10 spots all the way across, because again, we're still past all of this. So that is 4d that's there, 10. And this last little spot that I kind of ran myself out of room for here, if we're five spots into this p block for the iodine, we're ending with... 5p5 is that last little bit we would end with. And that's the proper order of how we would show everything as well. Now, that's a really long configuration to have to write out. And there's a lot of elements after iodine in the periodic table. Right? This periodic table goes to 118, iodine's only 53. There's a lot of elements after it. Um, and so this is why we often do shorthand notation instead. So shorthand notation for iodine, we would just go to the previous noble gas, which is krypton. So we can put krypton in brackets, right? And then after krypton, we'll write everything comes after it. This is the fifth row of the S block, so 5S. It's full, so 5S2. This is now 4D. Again, if we're in the fifth row, the D block's one less, so 4D. And if it's full, there's 10 spots. So counting all 10 spots across. And then we get into the 5P over here and we're five spots into the P block. So it'll be 5P5 would be the shorthand notation. So for the rest of these, I am just going to do the shorthand notation because, like I said, that's that's what we usually look at most of the time. It's what we're usually asked for most of the time because right now all of this is just kind of a hassle once we've done a few examples of doing that. So other ones then. Give people a, a minute to kind of catch up with this. Um, but the next one we are going to take a look at is manganese. Um, so this one's actually a little bit smaller element. Manganese is element 25 right here on the periodic table. <clears throat> so manganese, if I'm going to do just the shorthand notation, back up to the previous noble gas, which is going to be argon. So I have an argon core. And then after argon, this will be 4s. There's two of them that are full, so 4s2. And then how many spots in the D block? One, two, three, four, five. So remember, this is 3D for in the fourth row. 3D, five would be my configuration. All right, so that one, not as bad. It's not as big of an element. But if we want to go to, let's take a look at bismuth. Bismuth's a much bigger element, right? Bismuth, if I'm looking on my periodic tables, way down here, it's element 83. Excuse me, 83. 
So what I'm going to do, and I'll again, I'm going to scroll things around here so I can have the most space to hopefully show it, and then I'll put all I'll put all the configurations up on the the whiteboard thing there when I'm when I'm done with these examples, so you can double check things again. <clears throat> but for bismuth, if we do noble gas score, even the noble gas score will have a good bit to it. Bismuth element 83, previous noble gas is xenon. So we start with a xenon core. And then we want to look at what's next. So here's 54, 55 is over here. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is the sixth row on the periodic table. It's the S block. So 6S. We're past all the S blocks. So 6S2. After the 6S here, now we go into, notice it's not here in the D block. It actually is down in the F block. Right? So if I scroll down just a touch, this is going to be the F block down here, 56 down to 57, going across the F block. Now, again, this particular periodic table, maybe it wasn't my best choice to pick this exact one, uh, is that we, as we go across the F block, you might count 15 here, but it's really only 14 because really you can think of this element as being right here. So counting from here be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then we'd have one over here that would be then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 for the D block. So 10 for the D, 14 for the F, and the F atomic number wise does come first. So after 6S, we're going down to the 4F, and it'd be 4F, 14, and then 5D, 10. Right? F is 2 lower than the S block, right? That's why it's right, 6s going to then 4f, and then the d is one lower than what the s and the p's are, so that's why it's 5d, 10. And then to get to bismuth, we're three spots into the p block over here. For the p block, it's uh, in value, or kind of the principal quantum number is the same as the s, so if we're in the sixth row, it's 6s and 6p, so it'll be 6p, 3 for the end of that. That would be then our, our shorthand configuration for bismuth. And this is just the shorthand, Right, this is why I wanted to do shorthand for, really it's why shorthand's common, uh, because trying to do all of them all the way down to bismuth, I'd be wrapping around like a couple times here, writing it all out. Uh, and so that would be our, our shorthand configuration for bismuth. So I'm gonna move this periodic table out of the way for a second, and we're gonna scroll so you can see all these configurations that we had up. Let me just cut it off just a touch there. And so those are our examples there that we were showing for our configurations. Uh, so I'll give people a, a minute to kind of make sure you can double check all of this. Uh, I'm going to have a drink for myself. Uh, and then I have one last little bit that we're going to talk about that deals with doing uh, electron configurations for ions. It's kind of the, the new piece that we're going to add to things. So for our last bit then that we're going to move into, and I, I do have the answers here written as well, both full and shorthand notations for those examples we just did. <clears throat> Pop up. <clears throat> so the last thing we're going to talk about is a little bit with terminology and then look at what happens with our ions. So for our electron configurations, uh, I mentioned earlier this idea of core electrons uh, and how electrons can either be core or the other term that we can use is valence. So what these really mean, core electrons are electrons that are part of a full what we call shell. Um, you can think of it as a row. Sometimes you can actually just really think of it like if the D block is full, we'll consider that like a full shell for the D block. Uh, those would be core electrons then as well. Um, a lot of times our core electrons really are the noble gas cores uh, that we were just doing for our shorthand notations. If something is a valence electron, these are electrons that are in basically the outermost energy level for that particular atom that we're looking at. Um, and so these are basically, one way to think about this, it's the electrons that come after the noble gas core. Um, but I will kind of emphasize one other thing of saying that. Uh, if you have a full D block, the full D block is also still core. So even if you have a full D block that's after a noble gas core, like a full D block or a full F block, those still count as core electrons. Um, valence electrons typically are just for our outermost, at the highest energy level, or our highest like not filled orbitals. And I think it's easiest for me to kind of show uh, how to count your valence electrons here. So 
The reason we're going to talk about valence electrons, we're going to talk about them a lot in the next few chapters. Um, they're the ones that are responsible for all reactions and really bonding that occurs. They're the outermost electrons. They're the ones that are going to interact with other atoms. Um, and so that's where all the real chemistry is going to happen for any particular atom. So for non-transition metals, so something on the periodic table that's in like the S or P block, we only count S and P electrons as far as how many valence electrons something has. If something is a transition metal, we count both the S and the D electrons for their valence electrons. Uh, and really, I think the, the easiest thing to do, there's a table here, but the easiest thing is if I just actually show the periodic table again. If we're counting valence electrons, you're basically just counting your way across. So if we're, let's say we're looking at carbon, and we want to know how many valence electrons does carbon have. If we're in this P block over here, we are going to skip the D. And we're basically going to start counting over here. Be, this is the first column, so one, two, column three, column four. So this would be four valence electrons for everything in this column, not just carbon, but silicon, germanium, tin, and lead as well. <clears throat> if we have something that's a transition metal, let's say we have something like iron, we're just basically starting here and we're just counting until we get to that transition metal. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight columns. So iron will have eight valence electrons. That's the quickest, I think, fastest way to look at counting electrons for, or sorry, valence electrons uh, for any given atom. Uh, and again, the biggest thing, just deep P block over here, excuse me, the P block, we just skip the D's in the middle. So count, start counting over here, we have one, two, then coming over here, three, four, five, six, seven, so like something like fluorine, all of our halogens, they would all have seven valence electrons. That's how we would count that. So you can actually figure that out very quickly um, once you kind of get, get used to it uh, in terms of like counting valence electrons. And so we see here, I'm uh, looking for a couple of examples. So I have oxygen here that says it has six valence electrons. That's basically just from the fact that if we, again, here's oxygen, counting, we have column one, two, three, four, five, six. So six columns over, that's why it has six valence electrons. If we look for, here's germanium. It says germanium has four valence electrons. Here's germanium on the periodic table. So looking at its column, we'd have one, two, Again, it's in the P block, so skip all the middle. We have three, four, so four valence electrons for germanium. <clears throat> Something like iron, a transition metal. So for iron, it's right here. This is the one we just did. So we, count, we said counting across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's where that eight came from again. And then here we have arsenic. It tells us arsenic has five. If we find arsenic, here it is. It's under nitrogen. Counting over to nitrogen's column, one, two, three, four, five. That's where the five valence electrons will come from. All right. <coughs> ah, sorry, excuse me. So last little bit, I promise. I know this one's gone on for a, a good bit here. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is going to be electron configurations for ions uh, and how they change or what happens to, to help find these electron configurations for ions. So what we're going to do is we're basically just going to look at whatever the charge is on our ion. That's going to help us figure out how many total electrons were either added or removed. But the good news, unless what we're looking at is a transition metal, most of the time our ions are going to end up having a full noble gas core. That's the majority. Not every time, but the majority of them, that's kind of the pattern we will normally see. Um, but uh, for the for the most part, expect to see like full electron shells or almost noble gas cores for the majority of ions when we do them or look at them, especially if it's the common ion uh, for that particular element. Now, adding electrons is really easy, so anions are usually easier because if we add electrons, we just look for, well, what orbital isn't full? And we just add electrons to the orbitals that aren't full. That's pretty straightforward, I think. The trickier part is when we take electrons off. Um, in particular, where this gets a little weird, uh, we see the, here the, the description. Uh, electrons are removed uh, from the orbitals with the highest principal quantum number, then by the highest L value. So that means the highest N value gets removed first. Where this really shows up is transition metals, right? Because in the D block, like after the 4S, it's only 3D. So if you have something that has 4S and 3D electrons, the 4S, even though it filled first, those electrons actually come off first. Because it turns out they're actually slightly farther away from the nucleus, so they're just not held as tightly, so it's easier just to pluck those off first instead. And that's, like I said, that's where we'll usually see this come up. Now, examples, I think that's the, the easiest way to do this. So I'm going to show these uh, again on 
like on a whiteboard here. So these are the three examples we want to take a look at. Sodium going to Na+, and then we'll have chlorine going to Cl-, and then iron going to both Fe2+, and Fe3+. So writing these here, we'll have sodium going to Na+. We'll start with that one. So if we want to do sodium going to Na+, we're going to look at the periodic table first and get what is just sodium's configuration by itself. So sodium, it's right here. Sodium on its own normally would have a neon core and then be 3s1. But if it's sodium plus, it's going to lose one electron to get a positive charge. So that sodium is going to go from that neon core 3s1. It's going to lose that 3s1, and then it's just a neon core. That's it. Oops, let me make that a little more square. <clears throat> You could also, if instead of writing the neon core, if you don't like just leaving the noble gas core like that, you'll sometimes just see at that point you could write out the whole thing since this element's small. Or you could write that it has a helium core and say 2s2, 2p6. But probably most of the time you're going to see this top one uh, probably be the, the one that's most preferred uh, out of those three. <clears throat> so cations... Uh, if in this case, not too bad, right? We ended at a noble gas configuration. Um, cations get trickier if we're the transition metals, and we'll see that in a second. Um, the second example off the slide, which I've already forgotten which one it was, uh, chlorine going to Cl minus. So we want to show chlorine going to Cl minus. So again, to figure out the configuration of the ion, start with the plane element. So here's chlorine right here, element 17. So configuration should be a neon core, and then 2s2, 2p5, that's what we would start with normally. And then if it's Cl minus, we're adding an electron. Right, so here's the, the written out configuration. <clears throat> Cl minus means we're adding an electron. Well, the P, 2p5 is not yet full, so that's where that electron's gonna go. And so that means we'll now have a neon core and then 2s2, 2p6. Or at this point, adding that one electron to make this 2p6, one more over is argon, which is a noble gas. So we could write this also as just an argon core. Would also be perfectly fine. Either, either one of these would be perfectly acceptable uh, for the configuration for the chloride ion. All right, now the last one is the one that's a little bit trickier. So this was iron going to Fe2+. Plus. We'll do Fe2+, plus first, and then I'll show 3+. Plus. Um, once we've done 2+, plus, 3+, plus will be pretty easy. Uh, but the big key here, transition metals. Right? If I come, come over here, iron is a transition metal. Its previous gas is argon. Um, if you... It's like, like manganese and calcium and these others that we've done. It has uh, argon as its previous noble gas. And then after the noble gases we have, this is 4s2, and this is 3d6. So that's the configuration of plain iron. When we go to take those two electrons off, this is that tricky part that we, just, <clears throat> excuse me, that we said before. For transition metals, they will lose the s electrons first, then the d. So it's not actually the last one that was filled necessarily. So in this case, taking those two electrons off, it's going to have the same argon core, but we're basically just going to lose the two 4s electrons and now have 3d6. This would be the Fe2 plus configuration. And if now if we wanted the Fe3 plus configuration, we could take one more electron off and we'd have an argon core and it'd be a 3D5 configuration, because now it would lose one of its uh, <clears throat> one of its electrons from the d orbital finally. But it only loses electrons from the d orbital if all the 4s electrons are gone first. Um, and that's the biggest thing with ions for these electron configurations, just s orbital before d uh, for any valence electrons like that for a transition metal. Um, otherwise, everything else you're usually getting to or ending at a noble gas core uh, is the general patterns that you're going to see. All right, 
that's pretty much it for all the chapter six material. I know this one, this lecture actually went on a, a, a bit longer than I was expecting. So I do apologize a little bit for the, the general length. Uh, the good news, most of the actual homework and example problems for this particular section uh, are fairly quick, right? There's not any big calculations, it's mostly conceptual. Um, and so once you do some examples, like this stuff, if it seems a little bit confusing kind of on the first times of doing these, that's okay. Um, it's probably pretty normal. Once you've done just a small handful of examples on most of these, like for configurations or kind of things with quantum numbers, like they get really easy because it's very repetitive. Um, and so that's the good news. It does get much easier if you put in some time and kind of uh, look at those practice problems, like the homework problems, and get that repetition in. All right, so that's everything that I have here for today for the, the last part of Chapter 6. Uh, the next parts with Chapter 7 I'll probably get up sometime at the end of this week, uh, and that'll be looking at starting at uh, periodic trends. It'll be kind of our next topic that we'll get into.